Good morning. I am Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the commissioner. Can we get some of my BSNY guys in? Can y'all come and join us? Y'all see the ball head one, so we can feel, <laughs> you know, we can feel connected. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Good morning. I'm Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services Commissioner. And I'm so delighted to join you all this morning for a very special announcement. We're extremely proud of the work we are doing to make our fleet safer, more efficient, and environmentally sound. And today, we're proudly sharing that through the U.S. Department of Transportation's Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, also known as CMAC, the City of New York has received $10.1 million in grant funding to replace over 900 fossil fuel-powered vehicles with electric vehicles. This funding brings us one step closer to reaching our goal of achieving an all-electric fleet. It's a significant environmental win for our city. But before I continue, I would like to start by thanking Mayor Eric Adams for his unwavering leadership and support, our sister agencies, the New York City Department of Transportation, led by my partner, Commissioner Idanis Rodriguez. We appreciate your advocacy and partnership to secure this funding. The New York City Department of Sanitation for hosting us today. Julie Tai, Executive Director, New York League of Conservation Voters. And last, but certainly not least, I want to thank my entire DCAS fleet management team that's led by Deputy Commissioner Keith Kerman, who has really served as a visionary in the area of fleet management and innovation. Our city's fleet is critical to the work we do in service of all New Yorkers. It's how we move people, supplies, and resources. It's how we keep our city safe and thriving. But we also know that chief among our responsibilities to the people of New York is our role in ensuring the city's government and all of its functions operate effectively, efficiently, and in a sustainable manner. Thanks to the U.S. DOT and our very own Department of Transportation, we're moving closer to reimagining a city that runs on electric-powered vehicles that will protect the quality of life of millions of New Yorkers. Today, with this $10 million investment, we are reaffirming our commitment to electrify our city's fleet ahead of schedule because we understand that our climate, our city, and our people do not have a second to waste in our fight against emissions and its harmful effects on climate change. In September, we proudly announced that we had made more we had more than 4,000 electric vehicles as part of our fleet, a feat we achieved three years ahead of schedule, and now we are transitioning even more. But it's more than just adding electric vehicles. We also are building out our charging infrastructure to support the increase in electric vehicles. Using these funds, we are expanding our charging network to include more than 315 new electric chargers. Currently, we operate the largest electric charging network in New York State, with more than 1,360 charging ports and boasting 120 fast chargers. We also have 106 freestanding solar carports, the largest operating network in the nation. In fact, our newest solar carports are right here behind us. It's just one of the many ways we are implementing new features and capabilities to reimagine the city's fleet and protect all New Yorkers. A future where fleet operators fortify their position as standard bearers and set the tone for safe driving for this great city. With our defensive driving courses, telematics, surround and dash cameras, vehicle safety systems, and the successful pilot implementation of intelligent speed assistance, we're making strides and building a safer future. New York City continues to be a pioneer in municipal fleet management, and we're only poised to get stronger, greener, and greater. And with that, please join me in offering a warm welcome to someone who is setting the tone for innovation in city government, our fearless leader, Mayor Eric Adams. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. And you know, as we uh, sit here today, and I'm sure uh, that we are all uh, just nodding at how different the weather uh, is, uh, and it's, it's a moment of enjoyment, but at the same time, it's a moment of concern. Uh, winters are supposed to be uh, winters, summers are supposed to be summers, uh, 
falls are supposed to be falls. But it's clear that our environment is changing and our uh, contribution uh, to the destruction of our environment is real. Uh, you know, I always say we have two mothers. One gave birth to us. The other sustains us. And we have been abusive uh, to Mother Earth for far too long. And we have to do our part and our share. And it's about a real partnership. And some of the agencies that the commissioner mentioned, I want to also include uh, the amazing team at uh, DSNY. Uh, the commissioner there, Commissioner Tish, is really taking uh, the approach to uh, cleaning our environment, recycling our Queens uh, recycling program is just really uh, exceeding our expectations. Uh, but also by using green vehicles that's, as we clean the streets. And we have to get it right. It's going to be a balance. It's not uh, going to be perfect all the time, but it's about leaning into the challenges and moving forward uh, with that. Uh, again, uh, e electric vehicles, uh, they are clearly the future. And New York, uh, New York is see cars, trucks, and vans when they see them. And if it has our logo on it, trust me, it is contributing to the service of our city, but it's also contributing to cleaning our environment. And they can rest assured those vehicles are contributing to a greener a city. Last fall, as was mentioned, we announced that New York City met our 2025 goal in New York City Clean Fleet Plan three years early. Uh, we're moving at the right pace. Um, and New York is a now uh, served by a fleet of uh, 4,000 electric vehicles, something that uh, uh, Commissioner Pinnock has mentioned. And she has been on the forefront of making sure that those old vehicles are being brought in. Really want to commend her for the consistency of carrying out that, that role. And we're experience, experiencing the benefits, uh, cleaner air, fuel greenhouse emission, and cost savings and fuels. fuels. So there's a real win-win here. Uh, not only are we uh, ensuring that we're cleaning our economy and having a greener future, but we're saving the green dollars uh, that New Yorkers deserve us to do and do it in an efficient way. And we're bringing in the green. Uh, Commissioner, great job, uh, $10.1 million grant from the United States Department of Transportation. And it's really the cross-collaboration from all of our agencies uh, that we are laser-focused on the initiatives that we have in front of us. And the investment will allow us to get 1,000 fossil fuel vehicles off our roads. That's a real win and a real W for us. And it's the first ever purchase of all-electric pickup trucks and vans. And uh, the number and type of vehicles the commissioner mentioned, uh, but it is really reinforcing our uh, vehicle fleet to make sure that uh, we are successful. And so, someone, before you even ask the question, uh, is this added on to our fleet? No, it is not. It is not. We're not adding new vehicle, vehicles on our fleet. I was committed to decreasing our fleet size, and we're going to continue to move in the pathway to do so. Uh, we are also working to electrify DSNY's fleet with 25 plug-in hybrid street sweepers. And we're not stopping there. We're also installing 315 new electric chargers to power our growing fleet because we have to build out the infrastructure as we build out the vehicles. And so there's a combination and there's a sweet spot of making sure that we can have enough charging stations to fit this requirement. This is part of our ambitious plan to tackle the threat on climate control, climate, our climate problem head on and meet our goal of decarbonizing buildings and transportation sectors to reach our goal of carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, all of these initi initiatives include building the city's resiliency to protect our coastal and inland neighborhoods. Uh, storm after storm, we're a constant reminder uh, that we must uh, be vigilant of addressing uh, these coastal challenges we have. We are a coastal city. We're surrounded by water. Uh, we need to be uh, clear on that, and our pursuit of protecting our close coastal areas is important. But we also know it's not only the coastal areas. Uh, we saw what happened last year, even inland. Uh, we saw areas uh, that were flooded that I'd never witnessed before. I'm still amazed that we had to close the Brooklyn Bridge because of flooding, something that my entire lifetime I have not experienced. Reducing our res reliance on fossil fuels would expand 
and renewable energy assets and will push us in the right direction. We're really excited about what's happening at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Uh, it's going to turn into one of the largest offshore wind port facilities in the nation. Not only are we going to get the power, but it's also going to include green jobs. We're going to be hiring people to build out uh, the entire wind farm in that area. We're building more bike lanes and public transportation infrastructure to reduce our emission, uh, something that I'm really proud of what Commissioner Adonis Rodriguez is doing in DOT. It's about investing not only in uh, vehicles that we use for uh, government to travel, but also electrifying our school buses. These are vehicles we use all the time. We're being creative to make sure we electrify them to carry out the goal that's in front of us. And so all of our partners, uh, U.S. DOT, New York City DOT, DCAS, DSNY, and uh, particularly uh, Julie, the president of New York League of Conservation Voters, they have been real partners on this initiative, and we're going to continue to move forward as we put New Yorkers in the driver's seat of dealing with the environmental challenges that are in front of us. So congratulations. Uh, we want to thank uh, the federal government and federal agencies for uh, this $10.1 million in allocation. Uh, we're hoping that this money matches the dollars that they bring in to deal with these asylum seekers also. So, you know, we're asking for everything here in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. At this time, I'd like to welcome Julie Tai, Executive Director of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. It's so nice to be here on this um, unusually warm day. And you're right, we are seeing climate change front and center right here before us. Um, I'm Julie Tai. I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Vo Voters. We're a statewide environmental advocacy organization that fights for clean water, clean air, clean transportation, and open space through political action. And we're so excited to be here with you, Mayor, today for the announcement of $10 million in federal funds to help New York City go electric. It was just over two months ago I joined you when uh, we were announcing that 51 new electric school buses are coming to New York City with the help of funding from EPA. And we're sure to see a lot more money as we get more money for infrastructure and for electrification of our fleets from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, and from the IRA. Um, the transportation sector is a leading contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in New York, for controlling nearly 30 percent of our emissions. And fossil fuel burning vehicles cause air pollution, which cause, harms public health. It contributes to harmful respiratory conditions like asthma, rates of which have tripled in recent decades. In underserved communities, asthma rates are as much as 25% higher. So it is also a matter of environmental justice and keeping our commitment to prioritizing communities that have been for too long disproportionately impacted by pollution and the impacts of climate change. And we have to accelerate our, way, um, our, our transition away from fossil fuels towards zero emission vehicles. And this announcement replacing all these vehicles will help us to do that. When we're getting rid of our gas guzzlers, including our street sweepers and all these uh, medium vehicles um, with clean energy vehicles, we're making a huge step forward. And congratulations to DCAS for all the work that you're doing to get to those goals in, in, in advance of your schedule. Um, we encourage you to keep doing that, keep, keep the, uh, the pedal to the metal, so to speak, although we have to stop talking about accelerators. <laughs> yeah. No more gas pedals, right? Um, but we can't only transition our fleets. We have to make it easier for New Yorkers to electrify their rides. With the 350 new EV chargers coming, the message to residents is clear. Replace your fossil fuel-powered vehicle with one that's battery-powered, and the city's going to make sure you have the resources to power up. So, Mayor Adams, we thank you for your commitment to the environment, for putting the metal to the put pedal to the metal on the climate crisis, because um, we know whether it's the vehicle fleet, the clean buses, expanding the e-scooter pilot, more city bike locations, a more robust EV charging network, safer infra safer intersections, which we're really grateful for. You've been working to really get stuff done to clean up our transportation sector, and I want to thank DCAS Commissioner Don Pinnock and Commissioner Adonis Rodriguez for making sure that you're prioritizing the environment and advocating to get those funds here. New Yorkers are going to breathe a little bit easier because of all the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Next, I'd like to invite Adonis Rodriguez, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And Mr. Mayor Adam, as my daughter turned 16 yesterday, my little one being nine, whatever we're doing today is not for us. It's for that generation. 
Can we save the planet? That's a question. Can we handle another Sandy, Maria, Castrina, snowstorm flowing, going everywhere? You know, the storm that can hit California can also hit New York City in the near future. So I feel that, you know, we have lived all those, you know, natural disasters. And the question is, what is our responsibility? So no doubt that Mayor Adams, a leader, not in our city, but is showing all the municipalities across the nation how we can make our city more sustainable. And of course, in the name of more than 5,000 men and women at DOT, I was, so we also want to say thank you because you put in the resources to our agency to make the city more sustainable, to make the city more pedestrian and cycling friendly. Uh, today, announcement is a major step in the city's effort to urgently address the climate crisis. Each year, motor vehicles are, account for almost 30% of the city carbon emissions. That's why the DOT is working so hard every day to support sustainable modes, cycling, mass transit, and public adoption of electric or electrical vehicles. But we must also do our part as an as agency and as a city to reduce emissions from our fleet of city vehicles. And that's what Mayor Adams and Commissioner Dickas is doing today, together with all DOT, sanitation, and other agencies. We're thrilled to work with our sister agency, DSNY and DCAT, to allocate 10 million in federal funding to help replace nearly 925 fossil fuel burning vehicles with electric alternatives. These funds come from the DOT's allocation, congestion mitigation, and air quality funds from the federal government and will help the city reduce the environmental impact of our vehicles. Being able to shift this allocation to our city agency highlights how we are working as one city on the Mayo Island to get stuff done. And we're working to improve New Yorkers' access to electric vehicle charging as well. As part of our curbside level two charging pilot, DOT has installed 130 level two charging ports across the city with a focus on installation in the outer borough areas. Our goal is to install 1,000 curbside chargers by 2025 and 10,000 charging stations by 2030. And under this administration, led by Mayor Adams, we will be working hard to reach that goal. Together, these efforts to help us build a greener future for New York City, for the future generation, and for more than 48 visitors that have come here to New York City. I'd like to thank the Mayor Adams, the U.S. Department of Transportation, DCAS Commissioner Don Pinnock, and DSNY Commissioner Jessica Tisch for their collaboration. I also like to thank the talented DOT staff who have played an important role in this effort, including Susan McSherry, Mark Simon, and Renee Peter Smith. Thank you. Hoy estamos aquí en un día muy importante donde el alcalde Eric Adams, bajo su liderazgo, está tomando toda la medida necesaria para que más vehículos eléctricos estén en la calle de Nueva York, para hacer de Nueva York una ciudad que ten, tome más responsabilidad, para crear condiciones para que los neoyorquinos, los visitantes, puedan seguir visitando de una forma donde nosotros protegemos esta ciudad del cambio del medio ambiente. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that concludes our formal remarks. And so thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. We set a very aggressive target, and we are exactly where we want to be. We've identified all the vehicles, and we're currently auctioning off the remaining vehicles that we've identified. For the mayor, um, one of the most popular EVs in the country right now are e-bikes. Um, one of the big problems is in the city that cheaper batteries catch fire. Are you looking for any uh, federal funding or any other kind of funding to make it more accessible for people to have safe e-bike batteries? Yeah, and we we want to really look into um, the the, uh, the cheaper brand. And I have been communicating with some of my lawmakers. Uh, we have to stop the source. They should not be sold in our city. And our focus is to really look at it. There have been a number of cases of fires, uh, 
uh, where people have been ex ex uh, seriously injured or in some cases uh, they, they lost their lives. And so we're focusing on that. We haven't figured it all out yet. This is really new when you start to think about it, but it is definitely on our radar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Happy New Year. Same to you. <clears throat> Wanted to see if you had some uh, more details on those, uh, what was it, nearly 1,000 electric vehicles, right? Uh, which agencies will get them, how many you know, are allotted for a certain agency, and so on and so forth. And just off the top of my head, are there any EVs for NYPD? Uh, Don, you know where they're going? I'll turn it over to my colleague, Keith Kerman, for the exact allocation. However, to your question regarding the NYPD, yes, they were actually one of the first agencies to partner with us to have um, some of their um, vehicles switched out for Maquis. So, yes, um, electric vehicles are in use at the NYPD today. That's patrol cars? Like regular NYPD patrol cars? Yes, patrol cars. Hi, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Keith Kerman, Chief Fleet Officer. So just on the numbers, 360 of the e-transit vans, and those are right behind us, 150 of the e-lightning pickup trucks, and that's our first big order of medium-duty trucks. And so to give a reference, 25% of the city on-road fleet, 6,000 vehicles, are pickups and vans. So this is a really big move for us. 382 GM, um, GM bolts, um, and we operate over 800 of the bolts as our kind of core, you know, get around passenger car. Uh, then seven sanitation trucks and 25 of the electric sweepers. And so that's the breakup of what we're getting. Uh, we just reached 4,000 electric vehicles earlier or late last year, and this will get us to 5,000 as these all start coming in this year. And we'll give you a breakdown of what agency is going to get what, okay? Yeah, uh, for the mayor, when do you intend to start using electric vehicles for your personal, uh, for your official use? Whenever the NYPD, they determine, you know, what type of security that I have, what type of vehicles. So I'm open. I'm so low maintenance, man. You know, you know, whatever they determine is fine with me. I get up. I was on a train today. I had an electric uh, vehicle today, the train car. <laughs> I was on a train today. You know, riding the trains. I think we have the best public transportation system on the globe. Some people think otherwise, uh, but uh, I was on the electric car today, um, the four train. Ready to rock and roll? Yeah, we need a photo we'll out. do this quick photo out. Happy New Year. Happy New Year's to you. Today, a video has surfaced of an NYPD police officer using hammer punches to attack some teenagers in Staten Island. I have two questions. Number one, what's your reaction when you see a police officer being so brutal with somebody that they're trying to arrest? And secondly, does that kind of video make it more difficult for you to convince New Yorkers to trust the NYPD? Uh, uh, first, the first part, um, I was not happy what I saw in the video. I spoke with the commissioner last night, uh, communicated with the chancellor. This was an incident uh, that happened off school grounds. A young girl was being jumped by two other uh, ch children, and the police uh, intervened. It was NYPD, not school safety uh, agents. 
And so we are going to look at the body uh, cam of the police officers. That's why body cams are good. Uh, we're going to use a video that was posted on Instagram. That's when it first uh, came to my attention. And of my understanding, the police commi commissioner swiftly suspended the officer uh, that was involved. And now the Internal Affairs Bureau is doing a thorough investigation to determine exactly uh, what happened. Uh, I was not pleased with what I saw on the uh, on the uh, video. And to answer your question about uh, having New Yorkers trust the police department, they do. Uh, you know, I, I hear all the time, when I was on the subway system today, uh, people were saying they just feel good that they're seeing more and more police officers. Uh, that uniform presence, uh, I don't care who you are, you could be the staunchest critic of a police officer, uh, but uh, you know three numbers in this city, 911. And you're happy when they pull up. Uh, you are happy to see them late at night. You're happy if your child is out somewhere knowing that they're on the, on the street. The people of this city trust their police. They're happy to see their police. They feel comfortable at uh, January 1st at the ball drop, even when someone attacked three police officers, uh, the thousand that were there protected New Yorkers. And so these incidents are not going to erode the relationship that the people of the city have with their, the men and women of the New York City Police Department. Do you think that when New Yorkers see something like that, it, it gives them pause and makes them wonder about the training and why, some, why a police officer would think it's okay to hammer punch a young kid? No, I think to the contrary. Uh, I think that uh, when a teacher watched one of their colleagues being arrested for abusing a child, they know that's not them. They know that the overwhelming number of teachers are doing their job. Uh, when a uh, sanitation employee watch a member of their agency do something wrong, they know it's not the agency. Uh, I hope that we get away from the place that the numerical minority that does something incorrect is a reflection of the professionals in the city. And people know uh, the countless number of police officers run towards danger, not away from d danger. And we should be proud of having a police department with the level of restraint that they show. Uh, the, the incident last uh, on New Year's Day, we really need to understand what happened there. Thousands of New Yorkers were on the street. A person took a machete, attacked three officers. Those officers discharged one round Concern about the safety of everyone that was there, they immediately terminated the threat one round and then went back to protecting the people of, of, of the city. That's the training I'm talking about. That rookie, I was just at his graduation, and all the training he had, he didn't know what was going to happen in a split second Right there uh, on patrol, he responded. That's the type of training that I know, and I know that training is some of the best training because I have that training. You said yesterday um, that regarding the migrant crisis, there was no more room in the inn. Um, what did you mean by that? And do you understand why some people, it struck them as callous? Um, what is callous? Um, that, like, not compassionate towards the migrants who could still be arriving. Okay. Well, you know, um, 8.9 million New Yorkers, 36 million opinions. Uh, I have to navigate the challenges of telling everyday New Yorkers that we're watching a nice national crisis that's playing out on the stage of our city. N at one time, we had to deal with uh, Republican governors sending migrants to New York. Now we're dealing with Democratic governors sending migrants to New York. This is just unfair. It's unfair to El Paso. It's unfair to Chicago, Houston, Washington, New York City. This is unacceptable, what's happening. And we opened uh, uh, close to 60-something emergency shelters. Something of oh, 60 60-something emergency shelters. Uh, and we're not only uh, having to make sure that they have a place to sleep, which we are doing, but we also are having to overcrowd our schools, feed, clothe, health care. And we're not receiving any money from anyone. And so no one is sleeping on our streets because they can't find a place to sleep like others are doing. Uh, we are showing the compassion. And if anyone is stating, because I'm saying to the federal government and everyone else, 
that New York has done this year, that's not callous. What's callous is how we have been ignored as a city. And now I have to make tough decisions on the resources of New Yorkers that cycled out of COVID. New Yorkers are cycling out of COVID, and they're dealing with these crises. And we have over 30,000 people showed up at our doorstep, and we open our doors to them. It is time for the federal government to step up. And that is my message of no room at the end to the federal government. We will continue to do what we have been doing. And even when uh, they closed the borders, we were still getting in hundreds of people that were coming every day. We don't have any more room. And even without that room, we're going to find a way to fulfill our obligations. How are you? Happy New Year's to you. Um, I wanted to build off of the, your answer to the migrant um, situation. You know, Chicago Mayor Lightfoot recently criticized the Colorado governor. I'm sorry? Uh, Chicago Mayor Lightfoot recently criticized Colorado's governor for busing migrants to both New York and Chicago and called the practice inhumane. Do you agree with those remarks? And I was wondering what your message to President Biden is right now. Okay, so first let me peel back. Number one, her remarks, do I agree with them? You're damn right. You're damn right I do. Uh, for uh, the mayor, uh, for the governor, for the governor uh, uh, of Colorado to say that I'm going to push the problem to the city and didn't even notify us. You know, everyone knows what we're going through. And for that, ma for that governor to do that, I spoke with the mayor last week. Uh, this is just unacceptable. And I, and, I, and, and I think I have been extremely reserved on what has been happening. I don't know if we really f understand the magnitude of dropping 30,000 people in the city that's already going through a crisis. And it's as though people just, you know, okay, well, New York handled it. And we have. We have handled it. And then to match what the federal government is doing, we have all of these people who are talking about what we're not doing, but they're not even writing one letter to tell the federal government to give us the resources we need. But they waking up every day uh, saying, well, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? No, why don't you tell the federal government to fix this mess that they created? This is unacceptable. And I'm not going to sit back and allow New Yorkers to carry the burden of a man-made crisis. This must be fixed. This has to be fixed. And I don't know what's going to happen when Title 42 is, li is lifted. You know, so I think the Chicago mayor is right. When I spoke to her yesterday, she says, Eric, you know, we have been a little too patient. You know, we can't do anything to embarrass our families, but it's about time we start to do that. This is, this is inhumane of what's happening. And I'm just blown away that many people are critiquing us. No, critique the people who messed this, made this mess that are placing people in this environment. Hi, Mr. Mayor. To follow up on those two questions, the city put out an RFP for her. I'm wondering why put out an RFP and not just take the uh, other route that the city has made to just turn a hotel into a humanitarian emergency relief center? Um, I, I'm not understanding. You lost me. Break that down for me again. They put out a request for proposal for a new humanitarian emergency relief center. I want to know why the city is taking the route of putting out a request for a proposal this time around instead of just turning a hotel, as the city has done previously, turning that into a humanitarian relief center. A couple, a couple of things. Um, uh, we opened, I think, I think we had a total of 63 Hercs, uh, emergency hotels, uh, 63. These are real dollar amounts. That's attached to this. This is this is this is an expensive endeavor that we are in, uh, and we have to find ways of carrying out this task without bankrupting this city. And so, uh, my team at the budget office, uh, uh, my team, uh, Deputy Mayor William Isom, uh, they are meeting continuously to pivot, shift. 
and figure out how to solve this crisis that, w that, that was dropped on us. And maybe, you know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, well, there's no real urgency here because we're doing the job. So we're almost a victim of our success of doing the job. But go look at what happened, what's happening in El Paso. People are sleeping on the streets. <laughs> I mean, go look at what's happening in other places. You know, so we're doing our job. And I think because of that, people are feel, feel thinking that there's no, no crisis. No, there is a crisis. And we have to figure out every day, we start our day moving around the chess pieces to solve this crisis that we did not create. That's, that's real. Yes, sir. When you say the federal government, uh, we should be looking at the federal government's role in this situation, are you talking about, is President Biden to blame for the other states like Colorado continuing to send migrants here and overwhelm our resources? I, I, you know, you must not read your paper <laughs> because they answered that for me when I did my favorite um, talk show uh, the other day with Sid. Listen, we have to solve the migrant-immigrant issue. So it's easy to point to whoever is in the White House at the time. Those are Band-Aids. We have a problem at our borders. And El Paso shouldn't be going through this, and no other city should be going through this. And so when I say the federal government, I'm talking about Congress and the executive branch resolving this issue of our migrants. That's what I'm talking about. And I, we're not going to try to simplify this to say, well, you know, uh, should it be just uh, Washington? No, we have an immigrant crisis that we can't continue to ignore. How are you doing, Kimberly? Good to see you. Let's talk rats. Yes. Hate them. <laughs> Hate them. about the new summons, uh, the most recent summons, uh, and Curtis Lewa is going to offer his services to you today, I guess, to talk about, talk about uh, where you stand, and you said you smell rats. Well, well, first of all, um, I hope he leaves some of the cats on the block, because whatever it takes... I would rather see a cat than a rat any day. Uh, second, this is not a new summons. Uh, the summons was issued when I went to uh, speak about to get the old summons uh, dismissed. That summons was issued uh, the day after I went to testify. So I'm going to do like every New Yorker. I'm going to go back to court, show all my evidence. Uh, I spent $7,000 to do rat mitigation. You have to be really scared of rats to spend $7,000. $7,000 and still spending money to do so. We have a rat problem in the city. I mean, it's no, who, who are we kidding? And we're gonna continue. We have a couple of um, great programs we're doing that we, we will be rolling out. We're testing them now. Uh, my mission, as Jessica Tish states, rats don't run the city. And so I'm, I'm gonna go fight the summons bring my evidence, you know, as any New Yorkers. I encourage any New Yorker who believe uh, they will unjustly issue the summons to do so. You know, I, I have a, I have a, um, a video, uh, I have a camera at the house, and I look back on that date. Uh, my yard is clean. My garbage is in containers. Of, you know, I go there, I sweep up. My place is clean. I, I know I contribute to making sure we deal with the rat issue. And I encourage any New Yorker, you get a summons, you feel it was done unjustly, uh, go and fight it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow the process. Can that video be part of your evidence you're going to take? What is your evidence? Yeah, I have, I have a, I got a couple of exhibits. I'm looking forward to be the chocolate Perry Mason when I go into court <laughs> to, uh, to get, plead my case. You know, uh, I think I have some good evidence that I'm going to put in front of the court and, and show that uh, I, do a, I do a good job. I know my place has to be clean because people are always out there snooping. Uh, my, my yard is clean. The garbage is where it's supposed to be. I have containers. Um, you know, so you know, I'm a, I'll, I'll go present the case and let the, uh, let the judge decide. Thank you. Uh, continuing on, on rats. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, Curtis was saying earlier mm -hmm. that um, he can be your rat czar for free. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you're going to take him up on that offer. And then secondly, if you can just elaborate a little bit on what you just said um, to the previous question about the summons. Your yard is clean. The trash is in bins. The inspector said 
that's not accurate. So do you think someone at the Department of Health is, like, messing with you, issuing summonses that have already been cleared? Like, what do you think is going on there? Well, first, Curtis, yes, I will take him up on his offer. You know, uh, if he says he would be my rat czar for free, uh, I'm going to call him, and I would like for him to come on board to do it. Don't put it out there if you're not willing to uh, live up to it. If you're going to write a check, make sure you can cash it. So, yes, tell Curtis, come to be my rat czar, okay? And he's going to realize this is not a Tom and Jerry playful commercial here. This is real stuff. And so, yes, I look forward to him. I would make sure, uh, Don, can we bring him on board? He could be part of our internship program because I know he's probably been looking for a job since he lost the job that he was trying to get. Uh, so, yes, thank you very much for giving me that information. Um, and no, I don't think someone from DOHMH is targeting me. I don't, I don't think that at, at, at all. Anytime a New Yorker believes they uh, are issued a summons that they feel was incorrectly issued, they have a right to do so. My yard is clean. And the beauty is, as you alluded to, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a camera that I can show the picture of that date of what was in my yard. And uh, my uh, recyclables were in a, they were in a bag like they're supposed to be, not at the curb, but in a bag, uh, in a plastic uh, see-through bag. Uh, and my trash was in a bin. Uh, my house is, is well kept. I'm a neat freak. I'm a Virgo. We like neat things. Okay. Thank you. Ferry, um, what is the status of negotiations with the union and new NYC Waterways had to operate two trips on New Year's Eve? So how often does the city expect to be doing that? And when can Staten Island with respect the resolution to this problem? I know um, the Department of Labor is still in conversations, and we want to come to a resolution with those men and women who are doing a great job. Uh, and whatever we need to do to accomplish the task, if we need to use Waterway, we're going to use it. Uh, we're going to get people to and from Staten Island. They are not the uh, forgotten borough in this administration. I've been on Staten Island probably more than any other uh, modern-day mayor in a short period of time, so I'm looking forward. But, you no, know, hold on for a moment. There is one more thing I, I did want to do. I want to go off record for a moment. Sometimes you get your best stories when I go off message, I would say. Listen, I am so tired of the previous administration and their antics. Marsha, we've been in office for one year, and I am here in the previous administration attack us on Rikers. They wanted to see Rikers closed down, that they failed at. They attack us on the Department of Health and what we did around COVID. They were constantly, we were months into office, must be two months into office, and they were criticizing everything we did. We kept the schools closed, we should have closed them. We kept the man, we, they wanted a mass mandate. We said, no, we want to get our economy open. Everything we do, the previous administration. I don't remember an administration in history that says we want a full frontal assault in the first year of an administration like the previous administration. I called Bill the other day. I said, Bill, what's going on? You know, what's going on? And then the, the Bill's comms guy, who's probably the worst comms guy in the history of communication, he, he's an expert on everything now. Get this, Chris. I want to make sure you get this. <laughs> the guy's an expert on everything. No matter what we do, all of a sudden, y'all say, okay, let me, let me find someone to critique Eric Adams. You talk to everybody, and everybody says, no, we think Eric did the right thing. Oh, let's just find someone from the previous administration. And this guy, I'm going to attack Eric for everything. And you guys act like this guy is credible. Who cares what he thinks? <laughs> I mean, Marsha, let us do our job. They had eight years to do their job, eight years to fix Rikers, eight years to deal with crime, eight years to do with education, eight years to do, do with uh, early childhood education for children with disabilities, eight years to fix NYCHA. They had all the time to do their job. No. <laughs> no. But they are now... Once they're gone, they're experts on everything. And when you look through the last 12 months 
And you see how many times they have interfered. It's just not acceptable. But when I go to and look at the history, maybe you could tell me. You tell me when there has been a time that a previous administration has attacked another administration in the first year. Bloomberg's has been nothing but helpful. How can we help, Eric? Everyone, those from Koch administration calls us, how can we help? Bloomberg's administration calls us, how can we help? Dinkins' administration calls us, how can we help? Giuliani's administration calls us, how can we help? Every other administration calls us, how can we help? But we have the previous administration that just left the house. <laughs> they just left. They left the house in total disarray. And then they come and say, look at the mess that you, cre you, 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 fixed, you created, Eric. No, it's a mess we inherited. So all I'm saying, let us do our job the way you had an eight-year opportunity to do your job. And that's all of them. So don't start your blogs talking about critiquing NYCHA. Don't, every time we do something, run to the press so you can all of a sudden act like you're the greatest calm director there ever was. We don't want to hear your advice on Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I have a Department of Health and Mental Hygiene commissioner that got us out of COVID correctly and monkeypox and polio and many other issues. It's enough. How about saying our city is in a crisis and we want, we want to come and help the way Bloomberg has been doing, the way other administration personnel has been doing. They all come together. All these other administrations have come together and say, we want to help the city we love. And that was my message to the former mayor. I deserve better from a former administration. I deserve better. And my commissioners deserve better. Because if you were the mayor and the commissioner of this city, you know how challenging it is to run this city. Every day, every hour, there's another crisis. So respect the people who are doing the job that you just left. You are not going to hear from me when I'm done. I'm sitting under the sun. <laughs> you are not going to hear from me complaining about those who are on the front line of running a city as complex uh, as this city. Now, to Mayor de Blasio's credit, he has been extremely helpful. He has called. He said, how can I help? Here's what I went through. Here's what I think as advice. When I reached out to him, he has been there. This is directed to those who are intended on one thing. It's to see us fail. And I'm going to say this again. I'm the pilot. I'm the pilot. Everyone else is a passenger. So those people who are praying for the plane to crash, you want a plane. <laughs> you want a plane. You should be, we should all be praying Eric, land this thing. Let's land this thing. Tell them that. We're going to land this thing.